Hey, well, good morning, good afternoon, or maybe it's even good evening for you. Depending on when you are punching in, welcome to another episode of Jordan's Famous Friends. Today, I have the pleasure and joy of sitting down with my good friend, Drew Flam, also known to some of you as Dr. Drew Flam, or the president of Grace College. I looked up to Drew for a long time. We are fairly recent friends, um, just this past couple of years, Uh, but Drew's got a lot of achievements in not only the educational field, but just experience all over the board in regards to collegiate endeavors, as well as other endeavors, as you'll hear in just a few short moments. So, Dr. Drew Flam, thanks for joining me today, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Jordan. Well, I, I think the only reason I make the list of famous friends is because my wife's grandpa started the church that you now pastor. So I think that's my only uh, famous connection around your part. You do come to town a lot, like like every <laughs> <laughs> every so often. You know, the in-laws have a swimming pool. It's real attractive. It's true, right? Like every time like there's something going on at Bremen, I'm like, I'm going to get the Drew Flam text here in just a little bit, you know? <laughs> Oh, man. No, it's good to have you uh, on and just be able to talk and to connect. I'm realizing that, you know, if I want to talk to my friends, uh, I got to, like, make it official. So uh, that's kind of how we ended up to this point. So, Drew, got uh, some questions for you, um, and I know that you had some of those uh, previous, but uh, we start off every episode with just how you kind of got to this point in your life. I don't mm. run people's credentials down. I don't give them um, all the the things that, you know, make you you in regards to what you have done because it feels like uh, the reading of an obituary a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but we've also realized that people can kind of run on that too. So we're asking for the cliff note versions. If you could take us back, share with our listeners how you got to this point in your life being, you know, president of Grace College, some of those pivotal moments or decisions that shaped your journey. Yeah, I, uh, you know, sometimes when I think about my story, um, I think it's it's sort of the blessing of boring. And uh, I have a fairly, I would say, boring story. In other words, there's there's no like uh, magnificent turnarounds or uh, life crises that were extremely definable. Sure. And in many ways, that's a blessing. Yeah. Um, and I, I often say that to even our students on campus who, you know, they're like, I, I just kind of a boring testimony. And I'm like, well, what a blessing, <laughs> you know, the blessing of boring. And and I kind of had one of those grew up in a Christian home uh, in, in Iowa, then moved to Toledo, Ohio in high school, um, went off to Christian college, met my wife there at a college, was never sure what I wanted to do with my life. Um I have always been a little bit of a jack of all trades, master of none, like, like a lot of things and like to do a lot of things that are different and, and diverse, but never like the best at any of them. And, um, that has proven to be really helpful now in my role as president, because I can connect with students on all sorts of fronts, whether it's music or sports or the arts. Uh, but in, in college, I was just into everything, not sure what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and so I chose communication as a major, thought maybe ministry, thought maybe business, uh, ministry wise, you know, I was, I was kind of numbers oriented and, uh, would probably be too concerned with how many people showed up and, and how much money they gave. And if I went into business, just felt a little empty for me at that, that time of life and. So after I graduated, I ended up in Atlanta, Georgia, um, interned with Dr. Tim Elmore, who runs a ministry called Growing Leaders, and it's about just investing into young leaders. And that led me to working for John Maxwell for a little bit. Uh, And then as I was about to get married, came back to my alma mater, Cedarville University, and started working in advancement in the alumni office. And it was a job. It was not like, this is my career. This is what I was born to do. It was a job. Um, and a good place to be for a young married couple. But through that, discovered fundraising, um, which is not something in third grade you go, you know what I want to do when I grow up? I'd like to ask people for money. Sure. It's not usually on the list of options given. But for me, I, I found that, and it became one of those aha moments of like, oh, this is something that I could get really passionate about. It is certainly ministry. It's ministry to donors. 
it's ministry to students, it's investing in the kingdom, uh, it's investing in the mission of a an institution. And so it was it was very ministry oriented. You you get to know somebody's pocketbook, you quickly are going to get to know them very well. Hmm. And so I've loved the relationships with donors over the years and the ministry opportunity there. But it's business too. You got to hit your numbers. You got to make your visits. You got to put in the phone calls and and you're measured off of that success. And so for me, it became this, this perfect sort of middle ground of both ministry and business in a career field. And so I was there for a number of years at Cedarville. Uh, Eventually our family wanted to grow. And so we adopted um, our now oldest son, who's 13 in that process, wanted to move back closer to family. And um, Grace is about 30 minutes from where you live in Bremen and where my wife grew up and where we have a lot of family. And so uh, we we're looking for opportunities back this way. Ended up at working at uh, Manchester University when we moved to Winona Lake, Indiana. And um, just a few months later, an opportunity to become the VP of Advancement at Grace College hmm. came to uh, came up. And, and I, frankly, I thought it was a dream job. It was a job that I didn't think I was probably qualified for. I, actually, I knew I wasn't qualified for, but I, but I really wanted it. And, um, you know, through a series of events, through a whole search process, uh, they picked the young guy who lived down the street Mm -hmm. to be the VP of advancement. And um, just three weeks prior to me starting at Grace, our son came home from Ethiopia. And uh, all of that, just unbelievable providence of the Lord. Uh, Enjoyed many years serving in advancement at Grace and under the, the phenomenal leadership of Dr. Kadup, and then started taking on other responsibilities like admissions and marketing, stuff I didn't necessarily know, but I could learn. Um, and and then, you know, just just over two years ago was named to be the president. Again, went through a search process. I, I kind of always laughed. Grace has run two national searches with search companies, and they've hired me both times from down the street. Um, <laughs> didn't so, even have you to know, do it. Uh, Well, it was the wise thing to do in both cases, and I commend um, in both cases what they did. But uh, I'm very thankful for this opportunity and now been at it for two years here at Grace. And along the way, we've collected a few more children, so we now have uh, three kids. And as you said, we like to make trips off to Bremen (laughs) and uh, to be around family. So that's a great blessing for us. It feels like we travel 35 minutes, and yet we're very far away from the day-to-day stresses uh, of life. Um, near a college campus. Yeah, it's weird because I have the same view, but the opposite. Because we travel to Warsaw, we don't have family in Warsaw, but we'll go to <laughs> Warsaw to like get away, you know, Winona Lake area or whatnot. That's yep, funny. yep. For us, that's the way Bremen feels. It always feels like we're, you know, a long ways away, even though we just went thirty-five minutes away. No, no one cares that, uh, you know, I have this title called president. I'm just, you know. Uh, son-in-law and uncle and cousin and and those are great titles to have and uh, better titles to have than even president. For those that are listening, Bremen, Indiana is my favorite campground ever. It is it is the like Mayberry of the world. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good town, as they say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, with all that stuff, Drew, uh, you know that you've gone through, whether it be in academia or just all those experiences with, you know, being at Cedarville and Manchester and at Grace, we realize that books often play a profound impact in our lives. Any books or authors that have significantly influenced you or played a role in shaping your perspective as you kind of walk on this path? Well, you kind of always have to do the Bible answer, right? (laughs) And it's true um, that the Bible should be our primary source of wisdom and our primary source of uh, strength and courage. Um, But beyond that, um, I I wouldn't call myself a voracious reader. I I would say I'm a voracious podcaster. Uh, And I like to consume a lot of leadership type content on podcasts. And then I like to read more magazine articles and, um, and then fiction. So that, that tends to be more my operation. Like, you know, sometimes I, I, you can get the full book by listening to a podcast by the author. Yeah. Um, maybe without all the stories and, and fluff, 
you just get the main point. So that that tends to be how I function. But a couple authors that, you know, one in particular that's been influential in my leadership is uh, Lincioni. I just have really devoured everything he has produced um, as a great you know, just framework for leadership and, and even just how to operate meetings, how to operate uh, day-to-day schedules. Um, I also enjoy John Maxwell. I worked for him, so I've got all the books and, um, it, you know, his content is inspirational, I would say more, uh, but uh, I do enjoy it. And then probably my favorite leadership book, the one that I tend to distribute and even give to students, is called Leadership in Self-Deception uh, by the Arbinger Institute. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's more of those, it's a story, um, fictional story, but with profound insights and and the general gist of the story is that you know we are always or often in a box and that box is our perception of the world and how do we get outside of that box to be able to see situations circumstances from others perspective it's not a Christian book, but then I would add to that, you know, from even God's perspective, that we are just so often focused in, in our little box. So I've um, appreciated that book and given it often to others. What's, uh, what's your favorite Bible that you read out of? Do you have a favorite translation? You're the first person, actually, that said the Bible on this podcast. I'm just telling you right Oh, now. okay. Well, <laughs> about right uh, now, you know, because I, a lot of times yeah. I think people just take it as an duh, you know? Yeah, I, I typically I'm a, I typically read ESV, but there are contexts in which I'll you know also use the NIV, but typically ESV. And since you mentioned podcasts, give me your top two. Uh, probably the two that I listen to the most are the Carrie Newhoff podcast and the Greg Kershaw Leadership podcast. Yeah, um, but there are many others that you know whether they be things I don't disagree with on a political spectrum, left or right, just to learn. Um, or health podcasts like Huberman um, or Peter Atia, I'll I'll listen to those as well, just to you know learn a little bit about how to keep myself as healthy as possible. I, well, I could probably get from you on that because you're sort of you're way more of a health nut than I am, <laughs> but you know um, I'm trying to keep up once in a while. What's Peter's last name again? It's I. How do you spell it? Uh, uh, Atia. A T T I A. A T T I A. I've heard of him a couple of times, but never really like punched into him. But people talk about him a lot. He's a long, he's a, he's like a longevity guy. Yeah. Um, so his whole thing is um, kind of like the Octarian Olympics. You know, how do you maximize health for the longest period of time? Not, not like a live forever kind of guy, but just like, how do you stay healthy for the longest period of time in your life? Yeah. He's kind of like playing the long game for lack of a better word or trying to, yes. you know, and then yes. you're like, what do you do if you get hit by a car? And he's like, we don't talk about that. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I would not say there is necessarily an eternal perspective to uh, his work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With that said, uh, we're interested in like little things that make a big difference too. Uh, share with us a purchase or an investment that you've made recently. I'm going to ask you one later down the road, like you know something that was a, a while ago. But this one is is recently. It could be a purchase or an investment you've made that has a surprisingly positive impact on your life. It could be a product, service, experience, something that made a difference. Yeah, a couple things um, come to mind more recently. Um, one would be an Uller. Um, You're so going to have to spell that. So it's a O-O-L-E-R, I think. I would never have um, spelled it that way. I, it may be something different. I'm not sure. but So an Uller is a mattress pad that um, puts water through your mattress and, and heats or cools it at the level you so desire. Yeah. And for me, I tend to run hot. So um, like at nights, I just will not be able to sleep uh, because I get just so hot. So it, I set it at like 70, 71, and it keeps my mattress um, and our, my bed at 70, 71, and I sleep much better. Does it work? Or my wife's the opposite. She's got like a heating blanket on her side. So <laughs> Um, that would be a purchase if I were to name one that's, um, made a big difference for my sleep. Does it work though? The Uller system does work, huh? Oh, it works. Yeah. I love it. I, it works great for me. I've, I, I think it's fantastic. And I, it's the one I have is not like latest technology. So I think there's others that have been 
it may have been upgraded yeah. um you know but uh it works well for me yeah All right, keep going what do you got you said a couple you had a couple of them. oh okay another one um this one's just sort of funny i was thinking about it i was like so i'm a boring dresser um i wear gray pants blue shirt brown shoes like every day to work in the summer i wear a polo grace polo instead of the blue shirt but um to add a little pizzazz i started wearing a red belt and red shoelaces on my um on my dress shoes and i'm i'm a very boring dresser but just those two simple kind of i would say like just touches i guess um started getting picked up as like oh you're the you you wear a red belt or oh you're the red shoelace you know uh so just a little bit of a, a spark i guess and uh i have uh enjoy that it's made me maybe a, a, a little bit more interesting than just my boring clothes i wear most days that's amazing <laughs> you're getting known for being that guy you're that guy yeah yeah you're like <laughs> oh you're the red belt guy yeah with all those experiences that you have everything that you've been through we know that you know we can't be a success all the time there's failure in some of those steps that we've taken and failure oftentimes is a stepping stone to success Give us a time when you face failure or a setback, how you overcame it, what you learned from it, and how it shaped you to where you're at today. Yeah, my, my failures um, are the greatest teacher. And man, uh, I could recount many every day, of course. But I, I often tell students about a period of my life, um, my freshman year of college. So I came from a Christian high school, and it was small. And so it was, you know, you, you wanted to be on the basketball team, you're on the team. You want to be, you know, a pitcher, you're a pitcher. You want to, whatever you wanted to do, you could do it. You want to be in the play, you want to be on the worship team. So there were a lot of opportunities. And so I came into college probably a little arrogant, thinking like I was good at all these things um, because I was good at them at a small Christian high school. And in reality hit me when I got to college. Um, I tried out for the basketball team and, Apparently they weren't looking for, you know, slow guys that can't jump. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I tried out for the worship team and, you know, I knew some chords, but uh, was not a, by any means a great guitar player or singer. Didn't make the worship team. Um, tried out for chaplain. I'm thinking, OK, I, I like talking in front of people and didn't get elected to be the freshman class chaplain. Just it was sort of failure after failure after failure. My my first semester of my freshman year, and I'm like, you know, man, I, what am I, what am I doing? You know, what a, what's my purpose? What's my, and freshmen go through that a lot their first year of school of just what's my purpose? What's the direction the Lord has for me? Uh, an upperclassman, a senior, pulled me aside towards the end of that first semester, and he was like, hey. I've seen you at church. Why don't you come serve with me at the junior high youth group? And I'm thinking, that's not exactly what I had in mind. <laughs> you know, I was, I was thinking basketball player, worship leader, chaplain, you know, not like junior high youth group leader. Sure. Um, but I had time. So I was like, okay, you know, and started just volunteering in this junior high youth group. Found it to be really life-giving. Ended up doing that for the rest of my college career and what it led me to was, you know, more student leadership type stuff, you know, being an RA and um, helping lead events on campus. Eventually, my wife and I became student body president and vice president together. No one ran against us, but um, still it was, you know, good leadership opportunity. So, you know, God used those failures of, you know, maybe not being as good at things as I thought um, and the humbling experiences of that to, you know, lead me to serve in areas um where he really wanted me. And that ended up being really life giving. Yeah. First of all, I didn't know you played basketball. So that's number one. Like, <laughs> I mean, play is relative. <laughs> and then number two is I, I didn't know you played an instrument either. So that's, I mean, Hey, you learned something new. What, what was your instrument? Do you sing or were you actually like guitar player, drummer, bass player? My, yeah. My main instrument growing up was the violin. So kind of, I played classical Whoa. violin my whole life. And yeah. they they rejected you? Well, this was like the worship team, right? So I was trying out like guitar, lead singer, and and I can play the guitar and I can mostly carry a tune. So if you need me to, you know, lead, you know, with three chords at church, I can do that. 
but I was by no means very good. Here's the um, deal, man. If you want to come to Community Gospel and play violin, you're welcome any time. <laughs> well, <laughs> your wife is like a real musician, so I'm, I'm, I'm not like in that category at all. <laughs> With you kind of learning from that, and what happens is when we have those failures, we get into this... Um, I don't want to say it's a rut because it's not a rut. We just start, if we were honest with ourselves, we look back and we realize we've been saying the same message over and over and over again, based off of the things that we have experienced and the wisdom um, that has been imparted to us. If Drew Flam had a go-to message for the world, it's a philosophy or a a message that you kind of find yourself saying over and over again, what would it be? This is an interesting question because I was like, I don't, I I would have to, I don't know. Um, Now, certainly in my role at Grace, the message I preach over and over again is to know Christ and to make him known. Sure. Um, Because that's our, you know, our historical mission. It's our spiritual vision. Um, It's our spiritual goal as a campus. And it explains and is the why to everything we do. So in many senses, um, and you know this in a role like even pastor, sometimes your professional and personal get mixed. Um, and so since I talk about that all the time professionally, um, I think about it all the time personally as well. And what does it mean for me uh, when I'm not on a stage or I'm not, you know, uh, writing a message? What does it mean for me to know Christ and to make him known? And so, you know, I, I, to me, it's such a short, pithy statement that Dr. Alva J. McLean gave our institution um, and it's it's express everything that we want to do um, as a institution of higher education. So, you know, that, that would probably be my message to the world. Um, I'm not sure that, you know, that's exactly what you're looking for, but I think about it so much and I think about its application so much professionally that I, that I, and then obviously it's a statement that applies to us personally as well as what are we doing to grow in our knowledge of Christ? And yeah. then what are we doing um, to make him known wherever God has placed us. It's a question that I should probably ask your spouse. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you know, yeah, she probably, what does he say all the time? Yeah. Well, probably she would go, where's my keys? That's what I say all the time. Where's my keys? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like, notoriously lose everything. There's And when you find yourself like speaking or talking all the time and your spouse is around you, they look at you and like, he says this all the time. You know what I mean? Like they kind of roll their eyes like, oh, here we go again. You know, we're back on the horse. She would say, uh, you know, I often say teamwork makes the dream work, um, mainly because it makes her eyes roll. So that would probably <laughs> be a message she hears me say quite a bit. I know you said you don't... Um... I don't want to say you don't read because you definitely read. Um, but whether it be from books or from podcasts or um, looking at it from regards to articles, a lot of times people have quotes that resonate with them uh, and they find themselves repeating or something of that repetition comes up over and over again. Now, here's what we've learned from doing this podcast. Majority of people who quote any quote butcher it. So you have <laughs> the, the liberty of butchering a quote because what is heard and what is said sometimes are two different things. With that said, though, do you have any quotes that you live by? You know, there's some that stick with you. Um, and for me, the one that well, there's a couple, but one that has stuck with me for a long time. And it's it's one I do repeat all the time. And it's because my dad repeated it to me and it's a summation of Proverbs, but a wise lad makes a glad dad. Hmm. I've got three boys. And so I'm often just repeating my dad and saying, Hey, wise lad makes a glad dad. Uh, and so that's one that, you know, I, I try to live by. My dad still says that to me when he gets off the phone with me. Um, a wise lad makes a glad dad. And so I, you know, thankful for that heritage from the Lord that I'm just trying to pass on to my three boys as well. Um, another one that comes to mind is, you know, what I repeat to my kids every night, um, when they go to bed. And I think it's from veggie tales or something. Um, I don't know, but, uh, it was some book my son had, um, that had one of those push button speakers on it when he was a little baby and it said, God made you special and he loves you very much. Hmm. And then I've just added the phrase and I love you too. Yeah. Um, and so every night, you know, I just remind them like God made you special and he loves you very much. And I love you too. And it's a great reminder to me because there are some days that I don't feel very loved. 
Um, I don't feel very special. Um, I feel like a failure or I, I feel like um, I'm not good enough and I'm not good enough. That's the truth. But God has made me and you and everyone else special. We're made in his image and he loves us very much and so much so that he's willing to go to the cross for us. Right. Um, and so I just it's a good reminder to me every day to repeat that to my kids, repeat that to myself and remind them that God loves them and and I love them uh, as well. So those are probably two that, you know, you hear me say a lot right now. Um, there are just sometimes little phrases of scripture that, you know, stick with you for a period of time. Sure. Um, for me right now, it's, you know, God is my refuge and strength, my ever present help in trouble. Um, even though the the waters foam and, and the mountains quake, he's my refuge and strength. So that, that one's been, that verse has sort of been on repeat in my heart and mind recently. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. So we talked about investments in regards to short term. Um, and I'm glad your bed is cool because, uh, that's kind of affirmation for me because I've been thinking about that one for, for years and it keeps popping up like, Hey, cool off your bed. You know, you'll sleep better. Uh, <laughs> with that said, we invest in our time. We invest in our money. We invest our energy. What is the best or most worthwhile investment that you have made? that's made a significant impact on your personal or professional growth? I can mention many of them, and I don't know if I would put this in the category of best, um, but I am very thankful that at a young age, my parents, though they were Christian school teachers, you know, we were, you know, I would say lower middle class, um, they taught me how to, to view money and how to uh, utilize money to view it. One as like, this, this is God's uh, it's all God's and we are merely temporary stewards. But early on, I remember I did a, a paper route with my dad, third, fourth, fifth grade. And if I wanted to go to summer camp, I had to do a paper route. That was the only way to pay for it. My parents couldn't pay for it. Um, and so we did a paper out together and, you know, every couple of weeks you'd have to go door to door, you collect, collect the, um, funds for the paper from your, your patrons. And, and then, you know, you'd get your cut. Um, and I remember we'd sit down and we would talk through, okay, there's three buckets, right? There's your give bucket. That's not maybe the largest, but it's always the first. So, you know, how, how much are we going to put into the give bucket? Um, all right, now save. That's the second thing we need to do. How much are we going to save? And this is to save for future things like college and a car and things down the road that you want to do. Okay, now spend. You, you keep some left over to spend on things you want or you need here in the near term. And so I think learning that, I mean, you know, at age 8, 9, and 10 and getting in that habit of give, save, spend, give, save, spend – um, has just blessed me and my wife for <laughs> the rest of our life. I mean, that's, it's probably the thing we fight about least, you know, is money. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know for many others, that's not the case because she was raised very similar to me. Um, and so for us, it, you know, big cars, big house, fancy clothes, not really a temptation, not something we're interested in. Um, but our parents taught us how to steward, you know, the Lord's resources well and to ensure that we're generous um, and give. And that blesses uh, us and others that we save and that we, you know, have some left over to spend on the things we need. So, uh, you know, those just simple things have made a, you know, lifetime of difference. You've been fundraising ever since you were a kid. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> Switching from, you know, some of the heavy questions over to the lighter side of things, quirks and pleasures are uh, something all people have, right? Um, is there an unusual habit or a seemingly absurd thing that you're particularly fond of that brings you joy? I had to think about this for a while. Uh, but the one I came up with was is stretching. <laughs> like I love stretching and we make our kids stretch like every night before we go to bed and they hate it. And I'm like, do you, why do you hate stretching? I love stretching. Um, and so I don't know, maybe everyone hates stretching, 
But, you know, uh, on those mornings when I wake up earlier than my alarm, that's like, oh, I get some extra time for stretching this morning. Uh, yes. That's my first thought. And so, you know, um, and particularly doing like kind of hip stretching exercises, it just makes me feel better for the rest of the day. And I don't know if I'm odd in that regard, but I like stretching. <laughs> I don't know if you're odd. It just... <laughs> You might be the only person who enjoys it. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I like enjoy stretching. I'm like, oh, a little little five minute stretch break. That sounds really good right now. <laughs> That's funny. Change is constant, right? Growth comes from adopting new beliefs, behaviors, habits. I have to be really careful when I say the word beliefs with people because as believers and Christians, our beliefs don't change. They solidify. With that said, though, is there something you've incorporated into your life recently that has made a positive impact that has been new in regards to behaviors or habits? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, I, I've always been a bit reticent of the word self-care and, um, mainly because it's got that self part at the beginning. Sure. Uh, and that feels selfish of like focus on me, uh, focus on my needs. Um, but I am realizing that when my cup overflows with joy, I'm able to bring my joy and my best to others. Mm. And so when I'm empty, um, that affects everyone around me, my wife first and my kids, and then those who uh, work with me. And I think sometimes I've had the wrong mindset of just, you know, grit your teeth and bear it and keep going instead of you got to take time to refuel. You got to take time to do things you enjoy. You got to take time to invest in yourself, but not for the purpose of making your life better or making your life more enjoyable, but so that your cup can overflow and impact to others. So it's a bit of a mind shift change, I think for me. Um, and so, uh, you know, summertime I'm learning in higher ed is a, uh, is a time for some recoup and rejuvenation so that you're ready to let your cup overflow during the school year when things are going to get busy and crazy and, and students show up and um, the fun begins and, and also um, there are going to be problems to solve and goals to pursue. So, you know, uh, this summer I've tried to do a little bit better job of just, Hey, you know what? I'm going to go golfing at six fifteen AM and play nine holes because I like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I get to see the sunrise and re be reminded that our Lord is good and gracious and, lets the sun rise and set um, and and lets the sun shine on us all. So it's been little things like that for me to yeah. remind myself to rejuvenate. So with that rejuvenation, I'm not going to use the word enlightenment, but um, I don't have like a word that pops up. Uh, clarity, let's say that, right? Uh, and as you interact with people, and as, whether that's students or that's people who are donors or whatever the case is, given those experiences and insights, when you're sitting down and you're talking to somebody about the real world, what advice would you give if they ask about navigating the challenges of the world we live in today? Um, I was thinking about this question a little bit, and I was thinking about Nehemiah. And, uh, you know, Nehemiah, cupbearer to the king, comes, uh, his brothers come and tell him, you know, the walls of Jerusalem are broken down. And so the real world, right, was um, now this realization that his hometown was in disarray and the temple of God was uh, in disarray. And, and what was he going to do about it? Um, and when I often thought about Nehemiah, it's the beauty of him knowing that his, like where he was, was his purpose. I think sometimes we can get so caught up in being, uh, you know, the coach on the couch, right? Who thinks we could run the world or we could coach the team or we could do the thing better than the person who's doing it. 
Um, and so we can just get caught up in all the drama of everyone else's drama and what we would do if we were them and we had their power, or we had their place. Mm -hmm. And Nehemiah realized like his place was his purpose. The, the position that he had been given and the resources and the power that he had begin, been given, that was his purpose. And so um, sometimes I, I think the real world is wherever you are. You know, your real world is, you know, the good town of uh, Mayberry, Bremen, Indiana, and, and the church you serve. And um, and to not get too caught up in what's going on out there, but really impact wherever God has placed you mm -hmm. and not be too distracted. That doesn't mean to be uninformed. That doesn't mean to be uh, unrealistic, but to not be distracted by out the out there, but to be focused on wherever God has placed you. Yeah. So with that said, what peop what advice should people ignore? Um, <laughs> yeah, I thought about this one and <sighs> it's such a tough question. <laughs> it, it is. It, it is a tough question, but the first thing that came to mind is, you know, ignore the advice that you're right. Mm. Um, and assume, assume the best of others. You know, there's that principle that we always see our situation as a result of our cir circumstances and we see everyone else's decisions as a result of their character. Yeah. Um, and so we're often told like, Hey, you be you, you know, you, you own your story. You, you're, your story is the right story. And I think, I think to question your own motives and to question even your own character is a good thing. So just don't assume you're right. Yeah. Which is hard to do. Right. I mean, for whatever reason we have within us, this bent to saying I'm right and you're wrong, whether it's, you know, ignorance or whatever the case may be. So that's, that's super tough. Causes. Well, that, that's, uh, I mean, that's the perfect uh, temptation, right? I mean, yeah. that's the temptation that Satan gave Adam and Eve um, was that, hey, God's withholding something good from you. Um, he's withholding knowledge from you, and, and you're right. You deserve this. And that works on humans. It works on me every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This, this question is probably a little selfish because I was super curious when we started this way back at the beginning, how you would answer this. I've had this question in my mind because of the people that you rub shoulders with, especially like donors. But what are some bad recommendations that you often hear being the president of Grace College, as well as just a fundraising individual? Um, are there bad recommendations? I'm sure there are bad recommendations that come up, but just just a few of them. What what comes up that you hear? <laughs> yeah, bad recommendations. Well, uh, you know, one that I had to overcome in my role as president was that I needed to know everything mm. and read everything. So people loved sending me books and articles and you need to read this every day and you need to read that every day. And I quickly got I, I bought into it. Right. And I quickly got overwhelmed. I'm like, man, I have to there's so much I I have to know. And I work on a campus with a bunch of really smart PhDs who know a lot about their various subject matters. And I work with staff who are really good at what they do. And so I had to learn that I can't and shouldn't and won't know everything, um, but I need to find people that uh, I can trust to give me good information. Um, I have uh, on my team, Dr. John T. Van. And uh, he served as the interim president for six months before I started. Uh, his title is envoy to the president. I joke that he's my Gandalf, um, <laughs> that he's like my Yoda. He's, you know, a Princeton grad, extremely, extremely smart. And so um, he often will read a book and then send me the one page summary or um, he'll uh, call through a lot of articles and send me the ones he thinks I really need to read. Um, and so I really appreciate just that expertise because otherwise I get overwhelmed thinking I need to read and know, you know everything. Yeah. Um, you know, when it comes to fundraising, I think 
Um, one of the things I, I learned or is a, a bad recommendation, especially in the Christian fundraising world, um, is that we put people on a pedestal instead of God. Mm. Um, and it's the truth that fundraising sometimes works when you uh, build someone's ego up, <laughs> you know, right. uh, that is a, that is a way for someone to be motivated to make a gift. And, and I fall into that trap and that's always a hard thing to um, figure out exactly yeah. how to navigate. But when I call people to thank them for a gift, I always say, Hey, I want to praise God for your generosity. Yeah. Uh, which is what Paul always does. Right. Uh, I, I praise God for you. Yeah. Um, just to make sure that the emphasis first is not on the person and who they are or how important they are. We can get caught up in how much money they have or whatever, but to place the emphasis first on, you know, that we're giving the praise not to you, but to God. Yeah. And we're thankful that he used you. Yeah, that's a good take on it is let's focus on the gift and not the giver, you know, in regards to, man, that that's going to help, you know, this or whatever the case is not, you're so, you're so, you know, you're so rich. Thanks for all your money. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, like it just doesn't sound good for sure. Yep. Uh, what about in the last five years, have you become better at saying no to? <laughs> oh man, this is like the forever thing we all got to work on like that, you know, that stop doing list. So I don't think I'm really good at this at all. One thing, one thing that came to mind is bread. I bread. still have <laughs> food addiction issues for sure. Um, I can be a late night snacker, but for some reason, you know, bread and pop are two things that I've just been able to sort of like not want as much anymore. Uh, so, you know, those are, that came to mind. I'm starting, I think, to get a little bit better at saying no to speaking engagements or even, you know, things like this yeah. uh, podcast. I said yes to you because you're a good friend. I got I, you. I got you before you, you start know, saying no. So, yeah, well, <laughs> and I'm still not there yet. And it's not like I, it's not like I'm one of these guys that's getting, you know, hundreds of requests and I just have to, you know, work through my matrix of what it's, it's not that at all, Sure, but I'm um, just trying to guard my time with my family in particular a little bit better. Yeah, it is hard. Cause you can get so bogged down in it. Cause just cause it's a good thing doesn't mean it's a good thing. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So when you get overwhelmed or you find yourself becoming unfocused because you haven't said no to things, <laughs> <laughs> what, I mean, what do you do? How do you regain that focus and clarity? In the short term for me, um, you know, change of scenery is really important. So you will see me uh, walk a lot around campus or even in my neighborhood. So if I find myself being easily distracted or just overwhelmed or um, mentally fatigued, you know, a quick walk around the building, I like to take my phone calls outside and just walk around for 10, 15 minutes when I take a phone call. Hmm. So that staying active is really important to me. I'm a standing desk guy. Uh, and so I like to keep on the move. So for me, that's the biggest thing probably is just change the scenery, take a walk, pray, clear my head. It's the best thing for me. Yeah, for sure. Which can always be hard, right? Like to actually remove yourself from a situation when you're, you know, in that situation it's like you have to tell yourself almost like come on let's go like get away from what you're doing right now for a second yes I yes mean, or even if you find yourself like you said you know you're you're focusing on some work and then next thing you know you're you're way off in facebook world or reading yeah. some article and you're like whoa, whoa, whoa uh, i need to get back to what i was doing for me sometimes that's a moment to be like okay take a quick walk around the building and then get back at it yeah the last question I always ask people because I never want to miss anything is what is one thing people never ask you, but you wish that they would ask you. And the reason that I ask this question is because I think people have ulterior motives. Sometimes in talking to somebody, they're trying to either get something out of them or we're really good at formulating um, our responses instead of 
just asking questions to genuinely listen. And there's often times we're getting into conversations with people where we're like, man, I wish you would have asked me this, but you didn't. And I know sometimes it can be situational, but it often feels like there's things in every conversation where we're looking at people saying, man, I wish you would have asked me this, but uh, they didn't. What's one thing that you wish people would ask? Well, I, the first thing that came to mind is I wish people would ask me, Hey, can I take you golfing? Um, <laughs> so that was the, that's the first thing I wish people would ask me more. Um, as I thought about it a little bit more, like, you know, to be honest with you, this conversation has been really awkward for me because I'm not used to a one-sided conversation. Sure. Uh, um, I'm actually very more used to que- to, uh, conversations where I do most of the question asking. Yeah. And I find that particularly true um, with the generation of college students that I work with. Mm -hmm. Uh, Again, we have amazing students, love our students. They're phenomenal. Often if they ask me for a piece of advice, the piece of advice I ask them is to ask more questions. So for me, it's not actually about a particular question. It's about asking a question at all. Mm. Um, I just often have found in this generation – they they talk to each other um and it's this running dialogue and it doesn't necessarily flow logically it's just sort of you know hey check out this meme hey you know sports team and they're having a conversation but there's no questions in the conversation yeah for sure and i even find that true my wife and i will talk about that sometimes where a student will just come up to us and say hi dr flam and then they'll just stand there yeah. And then it's like, hey, how's your day? How are your classes going? What are you planning on doing this evening? And and we're like, we, I, I just uh, asking questions, period, hmm. I think is something many could work on. And especially maybe even the, in the younger generation. It is a lost art form, like to ask good questions, too, because there's a lot of times where people will ask you like, hey, how's it going? And they don't even care. Like you're just moving on to the next thing. Like it's a, it's almost like a buffer to get to the next stop on the bus, you know? <clears throat> sure. And I do think there's some no normalcy to that, right? You're walking along the sidewalk and you just say, what's up? Yeah. And you don't actually want to know what's up. You're just, I mean, it's a, it's a formality and there, that's fine. But I do think there is a, uh, we could get, we could be better question askers. Yeah, that's true. Um, my buddy Stephen McCoslin. Can, this is, these have been great questions. You've, you've been very thoughtful in the questions that you've, put together and made sure you know they're open-ended and so uh, kudos to that well i appreciate that my buddy steven mccoslin when he was on uh the podcast he kept trying to ask me the same question <laughs> like he would ask me it back <laughs> i wanted to do this whole time like well what do you think jordan well yeah. how about for you jordan because I, I i know a lot of these questions come from you know your own personal interest in the things that you care about and are you know, discipline and habits and, and all those type of things. I'm like, well, he's better at this than I am. He should be the one talking. But uh, I know that's not the purpose of the podcast. Yeah, he would he would like and I told him I was like, well, maybe some at some point, like I'll do my own, but I'd have to like redo it every year, you know, because some things change or whatnot. But he's like, this is painful. I don't like that you're not, you know, telling me what you think. <laughs> I'm with him. I'm with him 100%. So it's all good. But yeah, man, you, you made it through. And I um, appreciate you sharing your insights and experiences. And man, it's a pleasure just knowing you and being able to call you a friend. Before we wrap up, uh, anything else you want to share with the people who are listening, uh, projects you're working on or things that you have going on at Grace? Well, first of all, I'll just say thank you for your, uh, yeah, your friendship and also investment on our campus. You teach some classes and are, are down here and your wife's involved as well. So appreciate your ongoing investment as um, esteemed alum of Grace College. So, uh, you know, we're excited the year ahead. I mean, we're a month away from um, all of our students arriving on campus. And right now it's looking like it'll be, you know, our largest number of students that we've ever had. Uh, largest incoming class that can always change in a month, but that's where it stands right now. And that just gets me so excited because uh, that's more lives to impact. And again, that message of to know Christ and make him known, we get to be a big part of that to Mm -hmm. help them know what does Christ look like in the classroom? What's it look like in chapel? What's it look like on the ball field? 
and then prepare them through opportunities they get here for service to go make him known. And no matter what you're studying, be the best at it because that's going to be your avenue to share Christ through your vocation. So um, I always tell students, you know, nothing gets me more excited than thinking about the people they'll impact and the places they'll go Hmm. that I'll never go. Yeah. And uh, that's what wakes me up every day to do my job. So the Lord's been good and Grace Seminary, you're involved with the seminary as well, has been growing and thankful for the good work of our faculty and the various ways that they have made education available to anyone uh, online or on site or here on our campus. And so um, the Lord's doing good things. That doesn't mean it doesn't come with challenges. Anything good comes with a lot of challenges. Uh, But he has been so faithful and I praise him for the opportunity to be a part of this. Yeah, for anybody interested, uh, previous episode inter- interviewed uh, Freddie Gardoza, which is yeah. um, the president over at the seminary. So, uh, fantastic interview too, as well. well. If you want any tech, you know, tech, and he probably gave you all sorts of techie advice. That's like his <laughs> thing. He's so good at that kind of stuff. The digital discipler, as he calls himself. Yeah, yeah there you go. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of Jordan's Famous Friends. Uh, Remember, subscribe, rate, review the podcast. If this has been impactful for you, go ahead and click that share button. Or on all the major podcast platforms and you have the opportunity to go ahead and share this uh, in a digital way with uh, friends, family members, and people uh, that are near and dear to your heart. So stay tuned. we got some more inspiring conversations coming up. Remarkable individuals like Dr. Flam. But until next time, we'll talk to you soon.